The following is a video presentation of a morning worship service at Orville Baptist Church.
kind of know who you are, and I don't, I don't pretend to be someone that I'm not, and one of those things is incredibly forgetful. Um, I am constantly having to write down notes to myself, and even then, I do not follow up with a memory. So I can tell you a lot about, about myself. I'm tall, I'm bald, my memory <laughs> stinks. Uh, it's very, very bad. I do need to, to correct myself with the announcement this morning. Uh, I had to write a big, big font at the very top, and it did not make that one out. Next week, after our message, we'll move we'll on to um, the business team. So just have to have, have that announced to you. I completely forgot my apologies. I'm very, very sorry. So I literally get that down before I do forget again. All right, so you're in Acts chapter 5. Glad that we're continuing to go through this book. I want to share something. I think I've actually talked about it a little bit before and not going into this full detail, these full specifics, but about a year ago, Katie and I bought a house. Um, have I talked about these flowers that we have? I know I've talked with some individuals about it. I thought I had mentioned it before at church. Maybe not. Uh, we bought this house in the backyard. I mean, the, the previous owners just did this amazing job, an incredible job. They are total green thumbs. So all along, around the house and on the fence line are these beautiful plants. If you're a plant person and a flower person, I don't know them by name. All I know is that's pretty. That's about as far as I can get. But they were beautiful flowers, beautiful plants. Um, what's, the, what's the one? It's a, bitter, it's a bitter plate? Something kind of flower? That's what I was told. Y'all are as close cool as I am. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> And it literally gets about the size of a bit of this huge. They're just these incredible plants. And in the middle of the, of the backyard, I mean, smack dab in the middle are these planter boxes that no joke, I mean, wider than my wingspan. It's like a three tier offset planter box thing. It was massive. And so these lilies are growing as, as tall as I am. And so when we first get there, I'm like, look at all this stuff. There's no way I can allow it to survive because I'll kill it all. It's beautiful. Look. But I can at least try. There's one problem with our household and these, these, these flowers. And it's not just me and Katie, it's a four legged Dublin pitcher named Max. It did not take long to realize because when you let Max out the back door, he does not generally say it is time to frolic in the backyard. No, he runs 0 to 60 in 0.5 seconds and he runs hard. So as soon as you open that door, he's gone. And it took one day to realize he's going to trample every single one of these. All of them. The planter box in the middle, he would dive through them. I mean, it was just, it, there was no point in keeping them. And so to give the dog a little more space to run, I start reluctantly, not happily, not anything personal against flowers, I start pulling them all up. And it kind of hurt a little bit to know all that work, that, the, the previous owners, if they ever see this on video, they're going to kill me. They're going to do so much work in this. But I looked them all up. But they were all gone. The planter box was we, we, we took it apart. We got a lot of mulch to move. We got moved. And it was all gone. Max loved it. He's running all over the place. And we liked it too. We liked it better too. Not, not having all that upkeep. It did not take very long. They started growing again. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Now that I want them gone, even though they're pretty to look at, but now that I've decided I want to go, I want to go. Pull them up. Guess what? You go to our house right now, you'll see it. They're just, they're just at that stage when they're getting ready to kind of blossom. And I know they're going to be beautiful to look at. But because I wanted them gone, I now want them gone. And they won't stop. I had dug them. I thought. And maybe I just don't know you that. I just could have sworn to you that I got the ball out. I said, that's it, that's the ball. There's more than one ball, apparently. I had no idea. The main ball? Who? I, that's not, I don't know this stuff. So I got part of that, and then later on, I had to dig even further, and then dig even further. What is happening with me and those plants is what you're seeing in Acts with the apostles. No matter what happens to them, they just keep popping up. They just keep causing trouble for the powers that be. And so the powers that be in Acts 5, they've got a major gardening problem. They can't get rid of these beautiful, beautiful flowers. 
They've been told to stop, 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 stop treating the name of Christ, stop healing the name of Christ, stop bringing this man up. He's dead. And what do you see time and time and time again? Those pesky apostles and people doing the will of God over the little man. It's an incredible sight to behold. I'm so thankful that we're continuing to go through this book. And I, let me go ahead and warn you. You've heard a lot of these things that we're going over this morning already. One of my favorite things to say is if you see something repeated in the Bible, guess what? It's probably important. So you're going through some of the same things, but you're seeing ramped up versions of those things. Because it's becoming bigger. Persecution is growing wider. It's growing stronger. Just as I said, first I pulled the flower up. Then I had to dig deeper. Now I have to get the main bowl. Do you see the progression that happens with this? To get the outcome that I want, I have to do a little bit more. But guess what? The powers of me have to do that as well. They start off with a warning. They start off with jail. It gets worse. The measures grow stronger each and every time. So this morning I'm, I'm going to cover far more verses than I'm ever comfortable with. I can pretty safely say I'll read more uh, this morning than I ever will ever again. And that's okay. I promise you, we'll not be here until 3 p.m. 2 30, maybe, but not 3. So, so look at Acts 5. That's a joke. Please, can I take that serious? <laughs> Please turn to uh, Acts chapter 5. I want you to, to, to look at verse 17. We're going to read all the way through verse 26, and, and we'll jump from there. So here we go. But the high priest rose up, along with all his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees. They were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. I, I'm forgetting right back. I'm sorry. I, I love that so much. I love the way the angel presents this message. Taking them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple. Speak to them what? The whole message of this life. In other words, the gospel. It is your entire life. It is everything to who we are. Upon hearing this in verse 21, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all of the Senate and the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. They returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely. And the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are now standing in the temple and teaching the people. And the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for if they did, they were afraid of the people that they might be stolen. First thing I want to see this morning is nothing new that you have not heard already. But circumstances do not define the blessings of God. Our circumstances do not define the blessings of God. Only God defines those blessings. If you remember last week, you were with us. Peter and the apostles, they were performing it yet again. Incredible signs. Incredible wonders. Healing. People were coming from all over. They were told to stop doing these things. Do not do these things in the name of Christ. And then people were even putting the afflicted out on the side of the street, hoping, just hoping that Peter's shadow might fall upon them. And they would find healing from that. They look how that kind of parallel with Jesus as he walked through the crowd and the, the, the woman grabbed him to his, his garment to be healed. So you saw all of this happen. And then you saw the church witnessing, or you saw people witnessing the power of the church. And some people said, that's too dangerous for me. I don't want to be a part of that. I saw two people sin and mess up and then fall dead. They said, I don't, I'm not so sure about this kind of commitment because this is so much. Other people heard the gospel. They heard the call and they answered. And they saw new life. They saw a new beginning. They saw a new family. They saw salvation. So they became disciples. And it said the church is continuing to grow over and over and over again. And then once more, the Sadducees, they just cannot allow this behavior to continue. 
They can't allow the, the church to continue to grow and to blossom. And so what do they do? As we just read, they place the apostles in a public jail. Uh, no stretch of the imagination. I'm telling you these are bad conditions to be in a public jail. We read that and in our worldly flesh. We say that's not a good thing to be thrown into jail. You ask anyone out in the world, is, is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? It's going to be a pretty immediate response to say there's nothing that can good happen in, in, in a public jail. This is a, this is a bad, bad thing. There's, there's just no way this can be a blessing. There's no possible way that you could come and, and see a blessing out of being thrown in jail. I think this is important for us to see that our version of blessing, it is not always the same as what God sees as blessing. And vitally important. We're very, very guilty of often just overlooking His blessing. Many times we take that a step further. We not only overlook His blessing, we already have expectations of what those blessings should be. So when they do not happen, we say, where are you, God? Where are you? Where are my blessings? I, like, I do good things. I do what you call me to do. And so where are these blessings we read about in the Scriptures? Do not confuse us as a church. We should not be people who confuse what God's blessings are with what we expect to happen. To us. It is God who defines blessing. It is God who defines cursing. And so they they come from Him, not from us. There's a text that I will I will read many times this morning out of Proverbs 3. It will be the, the backdrop of our entire message this morning. Verses 33 through 35. It says the following in the book of Proverbs. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. The wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. It is a perfect text as we go through Acts 5. It is the jail of apostles who experience the blessing. It is the house of the, the self-righteous, the house of the wicked, the ones that think they hold all the power, all of the truth. It is those that cling to the curse of God. There's a, you see the flip-flop happening here. It is the ones going to a public jail who experience the blessing. Now, the Sadducees, they think they've got the apostles right where they want them. I want to remind you for a moment, we did this about a month ago. We went over the Sadducees. We talked about what they believe. Well, in this case, we want to talk about what they do not believe. I think that's more appropriate. They do not believe in the type of afterlife that we would say is a heaven and hell. That life just is. The Sadducees did not believe in Christ, surely, you know why? Because they denied resurrection. And the moment that you deny resurrection, guess what you deny? Christ. They denied supernatural workings of God. And, and this is so ironic to me. Because what has been happening all through Acts that you can verify and see, and at one point they even say, we can't deny this is happening. Christ at work. The Holy Spirit moving in a major, major way, and yet they cling to a belief that says God doesn't do that. The last one I want us to remember is the Sadducees had a problem with demonic activity and angelic activity. They did not believe these things happened. One commentator that I read as I was going through Acts 5 said this is proof God has a sense of humor, and I believe that very much so. They don't believe in angels. And then what is the messenger? What is the form that comes to release the apostles from jail and send the message to go proclaim the gospel? An angel. An angel. People will say, God has, has a sense of humor. Just go tell them your plans. I, I know that feeling. I'm sure many of you do too. God won't do this today. And what happens? We'll see about that. I, I really enjoy it when, when God shows off. I enjoy that quite a bit. And so God could have just made... The gate's open and snap the stand. God could have just simply said, poof, you're released. And yet, what did he do? He sends an angel on his behalf. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he stops at the scoffer, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. So Peter and the apostles are once again told to stop doing what they're doing. 
And just like last time they're brought before them, Peter explains, we must honor God before we obey man. We must obey God before we obey man. And verse 27 is where I'm going to pick up. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem. Do not miss that right there. Did you hear that? We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have done what? It does not say you have continued to preach. It does not say that you have continued to talk about this man. It does not say you have continued to heal in his name. It says you have filled Jerusalem. Do you remember the promise that was given to the church in the first chapter of Acts? You will go where? Jerusalem. And now the gospel is saturated all throughout the area because of the work of Christ. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29, but Peter and the apostle answered, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Remember this, we, we, this is, a, this is a, just another picture. We went through almost exactly the same scenario a couple of chapters ago. Almost the same message given to the powers that be. What was it that the crowd and the, the self-righteous begged in the book of Matthew when dealing with Pilate? And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. They begged. They were excited. To take on the guilt of killing Jesus. They begged for his blood to be on them. They wanted to kill him. What did Pilate do? Remember? Washed their hands of this. The guilt was placed upon them. And so you've got people who deny Christ, deny the resurrection, deny angels, and then Peter says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. The lies will impair honor. Fools display this honor. One of my favorite sayings, I mean this a lot, uh, not as advice, but something for us to think about. One of the single greatest and most effective and efficient ways that God brings us judgment, not just the church, but the world. One of the most common ways in which God gives us judgment is by giving us exactly what we want. There are so many times people say, well, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Because we beg for it and we walk into it willing. Absolutely willing. This is exactly what we have asked for. And at some point, God will say, it's yours. You wanted it, you got it. It's a scary thing to think about. I can certainly look back over my life and see where God has said, that's what you wanted in life? Have it. And it's an absolute mystery for me. Many of you can find a test of the same exact thing. It's exactly what I wanted. And then when you finally get it, you say, this is, this is not right. This is not right. Unfortunately, the message does not reach the ears of the, of the Sadducees. They... They don't, they don't view it in this way. So they asked for Christ to be murdered. They were excited about taking the deal. They asked for his blood. They denied Abel. They denied Christ. They denied resurrection. And now standing right before them, right in front of them, are witnesses to the risen Son, witnesses to the power and the work of Christ, witnesses to angelic activity and visitation, witnesses to the bold proclamation of the gospel. And it was brought about how? All of this working, how did it come about? From a prison sentence. Do you see what I mean? The idea that we know what's best for us and the church knows what's best for us. We know what blessings we want. It might not come the way we expect because God has a better way. He's got a better plan and a better purpose. And so all of this, all of this bold proclamation of the truth, it all begins with being placed in jail. And once again, you see Proverbs 3 being lived out. 
The wise will appear in honor, and the, but fools will display dishonor. The honor that is given to us, given to the church, it might not be a grand spectacle. It might not be uh, some, some form of applause. It might not be something that is seen by others. It might not be something that makes us look impressive. That is not always the case. I, there is no greater blessing, hear me out, for each of us, individually or as a church. There's no single greater blessing that I can think of in being, being in the will of God. To me, that is just, I don't know what else I can ask for. I don't know what else I can cling to. But to be in God's will and then to be equipped to be obedient to that will, what more do we need? What else is there? I'm not so sure that I have a good answer for what else needs to happen other than that. And so when that happens, we, when we are in the will of God, when we are equipped by the Spirit to be obedient to God's will, don't expect the world to lift us up in applause. Don't expect the world to be impressed and blown away by what we do. Don't expect man to, to lift us. God's not impressed by what the world thinks about us, but He is honored. And likewise, we are honored and also blessed when we're aligned with His will. It's in this way that the church inherits honor. Also, on the flip side, look at, again, I've been talking about Proverbs 3, is, is the fool who displays dishonor. The righteous inherit this, this unseen honor. And listen, fools do not inherit dishonor. There's a big difference here. The wise will inherit honor. Fools don't inherit this honor. They walk in it themselves. They don't need any help. You can see it laid out perfectly right here in Acts. The ones who thought they, they had the right they wanted, the ones who thought they had the truth, it's being spun right back into their face. There doesn't need to be any help. They will bring about this dishonor on their very own. And so, do not fool ourselves as a church. We cannot be fooled into thinking that our circumstances in this life define God's blessing. Our task is to be obedient to Him, to what He has commanded for us, His plans for us. And there will be tough roads, there will be detours, there will be speed bumps. But I will tell you this, I would rather um, any day of the week I would much rather walk through the valley of God than walk through a smooth path as a fool. Every day. I would rather go through hell and back knowing that I'm in the will of God than to walk blissfully ignorant in the path of the fool. It is worth it. It's absolutely worth it. It's the one thing that we can count on day in and day out. No, God is right there alongside and you saw what happened in the blessing of the apostles being placed in that jail. Mm -hmm. Who are we to say that jail is a bad thing in this book? Go on to verses 33 to 42. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, you have to help me out here. Judas? Anybody got the got a dictionary with them on that name? That no? Okay, we'll go with Judas. Claimed to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed with him were scattered. And so in this present case, you may be say all this. I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if, listen to this, 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 is, where we're, this is where we're kind of anchored right there. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. Or else you may even be found fighting against God. Verse 40. They took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy.
to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Do you see? We, we talked about this two weeks in a row, a third time this morning. Success is not the measure of worldly success. What we call success is not the measure of heavenly blessing. So it's one thing not to let our circumstances define it, and then on top of that, it's another thing to not let the level of that success define if it is successful at all. We want to be in the will of God and what He wants, not what we say. Now, you, you may be hearing all this and say, how do you even get that out of that text? Where do you, how do you see that in, in that little snippet of text? Well, I want you to think about the man for a moment. This man is a Pharisee. There should be gaps in that. Who was the one who said, don't do this? A Pharisee. Do you, you, see, do, you, do you see why I have this reaction? A Pharisee is the one who says, don't take any action against me. It's incredible to me. That's crazy. And so this, this Gamaliel, was, he was the top dog, so to speak. Later on, you see, he, um, he taught someone that we will come to in the, in the book of Acts of, of very big importance. But he's, he's head honcho. He knows the law. Very influential. And the Pharisees were of the people. They had a very good relationship with the common man. He said, this is unwise for you to do this. You should not do this. This is, you might even be on the wrong side of it. Now, his logic sounds good. Because you read that and you say, well, it worked out nicely. That, that makes sense. He was basically arguing this. He said, if these apostles are doing the work of man, and it's just man, look. There's been other people who have tried. There's been people who have come up and said, hey, I'm the Messiah, follow me, and we'll get this thing going. And he even gives, some, he gives two examples. And says, these men tried to do the work of man, and, and guess what? They didn't last. It didn't work out. And so Gamaliel was saying, look, if it's just a man-made type movement that they're doing, it'll get overthrown. It won't even matter. But if it is from God, if it truly is from God, it will succeed. But there's no way it will be stopped. In fact, you might even be on the opposite end of, of this, this new movement. You might be the one who is in opposition to God and what He's doing. In this specific case, guess what? He may be able to He is right. God does have a plan for His church, and it will not be thwarted. Do you need proof? Who are you? You're the church. How many years later, still going? So yes, there is a plan for the church. And in this specific case, the man was right. We're still here. What he says to them, however, is not always true. He's basically saying, if there is some kind of level of success, then it must be from God. If it doesn't work, then it, it really just, it's probably from man, and it really doesn't work out anyway. If we measure everything with that same logic, that same logic that he may have used, we will be in big, big, big trouble. Big trouble. It's like looking at the numbers and saying, well, because they're not good, we might as well close shop. Because there have not been baptisms here at Orville that day. Can we just go ahead and call a business meeting now and vote to, to bring this up? Let's just see that it all. We're not using it, right? Who would vote in favor of that? If you raise your hand, you're in trouble. But do you see what I mean? We pray for baptism. We want to see baptisms ha happen. But it doesn't mean we just say, ah, I can it. There's no success. So just move on. We're not even worried about it anymore. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the exact opposite is true. We said the exact same thing last week. I'll even take a step further. And I, I, again, I don't say it to be mean. I don't say it to throw off. We've been talking about false teachers lately. We've been going through the book of Jude. We've been going through Second Peter before. Right now, this very moment, what time is it? It's 11 God, my goodness. Right now, at this very moment, right now, about 43,000 people are congregating.
ordained for the most, quote, successful church in America. Forty, can you imagine that? 43,000 are gathered as the church. Now, I call it the church. I use that term loosely because when you're pastored by Joel Osteen, you're no longer part of the church. Again, not to throw up on Joel Osteen, but at the same time, yes, to throw up on Joel Osteen. You're not a pastor, you're a false teacher, you're a wolf. Just because there's numbers does not mean that there's something in the movement of God. And we're so quick to say, well, look what they're doing, so it must be something big. The argument is not about, well, if it's big, it's from God. There are also big churches that are doing great things for God because they're in the will of God. Very good things for God. So the point is not about the level of success. That's my whole point. It's not about whether there's 10 or 10,000. It doesn't matter. There can be big churches of 10,000 who are far from the will of God. There can be a church of 10,000, 5,000 in the road who are very much in the will of God. It doesn't matter. The same is true here in the world. We are not packed like sardines right now. We're not. We're not kicking people out of the church because we don't have the room. We have to build all of them. We're not having that problem. There is an identity question we must face. All churches must face. Every single one of us. Are we in the will of God? But whether or not the future pact has no barrier. We want to read people because we love people. Not because we want to see some impressive spectacle happen. You see Gamaliel's logic and how it fails. In this one instance, it works out perfectly because there is nothing to thwart the church and the work, the work of Christ. Look at verses 40 through 42. They took his advice and after calling the apostles, and they flogged him and ordered him not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released him. They went on their way for the presence of the council, rejoicing. But they have been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day the temple went from the house to house. They kept right on teaching the preaching of Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard that? Did you see that one key word or phrase? Worthy to suffer shame? Worthy to suffer shame. Worthy to suffer shame. Blows me away when I read that. For his name. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Live that once more. So far, God has used an angel, he's used something that the Sadducees didn't believe in, and now he's using the most educated Pharisee to continue the work of the church. The wise will inherit dishonor, and the fools display dishonor. And so we keep going over these things, and yet again, we see another element of this upside down kingdom. This flip-flopped kingdom where the true power, it does not lie in human institutions. It does not rely or belong in political parties, but it's found amongst the lowly. It is found in odd places. And as you leave this morning, I want you, I want you to remember all of this with Proverbs 3 as kind of that backdrop. Kind of to influence Acts 5. And so, guess what? Today, I will, I will go home. Uh, I'll let the dog out, and I'll see those plants I can't get rid of. And I'll say, my goodness, are you kidding me? And I won't do it today, but eventually, listen to this, eventually, the day is coming, where I'm going to pull that plant up. I might give it one more try. I might really, I mean, I've gotten the, uh, see, I, what is the three prong? little small one called? Garden of Claws, is what I call it. I told you, I don't do my plant. I'm not a horticulturist. I've used that before. I might do the shovel next. But eventually, if I cannot get rid of those plants, you know what I'll do. The roundup. The herbicide. Now that sounds funny, but keep that in mind with Acts. Because think about the illustration for a moment. Having to continue to do more to more and then, and then more. The day is coming where the apostles will start seeing that. The day is coming where the people of God are going to start seeing that. The church today, and we are still, all of us, we are still those beautiful flowers that the world pulls up. I pray that it does not happen to us, but 
here in the book of Acts, you're about to see coming soon. Very drastic measures being taken to try to get rid of them. What a testimony. This is why I get so excited about church history, because you think about all this. With all that we're going through in Acts, we still stand because of the continued work of Christ. We are still here. We are still proclaiming the gospel. Nothing has been affected in shutting up the church. Nothing has been affected in keeping us quiet. And yet, what were the words of the apostles? They were honored to be found worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. You tell me if that sounds like a blessing to you, because to me it sure does. It is God's person of blessing. The enemy is at work against the church. We've seen him attack. We're closing up right here. We've seen him attack the church through persecution. It didn't work. Then we saw Ananias and Sapphira come forward and bring money. Remember, they lied to the Spirit. And they were true believers. And so the enemy attacked the church from the outside. He attacked the church from the inside with God's own people. And now a new attack comes next week. I don't ever want anyone to hear me say, hey, don't read your Bibles for next week and don't be prepared because I have a special message for you. No, I would love for you to read Acts 6 next week or throughout this week. Go ahead and see what is coming. There's a new attack coming for the church in the New Testament. And it's a new way the enemy is attacking from the inside. I encourage you to go through Acts 6 to see this for yourself, to see how the enemy works. And yet remembering through all, throughout all of this, we are still here. Not our power, not our own flesh and blood, not our works, God's works. Because he has a plan for the church. He has a will for the church because Christ is still a word. I end again. See it even more next week. Proverbs 33, 33, 35. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he scoffs at the scoffers, and he gives grace to the afflicted. The wise will carry honor, but fools display dishonor.